Hey, on today's On.NET show, we're going to be looking at a new tool that enables you to write safer, more reliable async code. It's called Coyote. Come check it out. Hey, welcome to another episode of the On.NET Show. Today, we're going to be talking with Chris Lovett about how to write reliable async code with a new uh, project he's been working on called Coyote. So Chris, thanks for coming on the show. And um, you know, maybe you could introduce yourself, and then we'll get into the topic. Yeah, hi, Rich. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Coyote is a new project, and I'm all excited to share this with, with folks, get the word out there. We've been uh, working on how to improve the state of the art for testing and debugging asynchronous code. Uh, we have customers in Azure that are pulling their hair out, you know, staying up all night trying to find that really pesky little bug to do with, uh, you know, parallel code, concurrent code, async code. And uh, you can get yourself into some, some really difficult situations. So Coyote is a, a project that came out of Microsoft Research. It's been around for a while uh, under a different name called P Sharp, uh, which some people may be familiar with. And we're sort of going through a bit of a, a productization phase right now, making this more than a research project. We're putting devs on it, we're putting PMs on it, and we're really uh, you know, making the customers happy and not, not just pure research. And so that's why it's uh, rebranded under this under this new name. Makes sense. Um, and we, we were just talking before, and it sounds like uh, we actually have some shared shared heritage. We both worked on early .NET and also XML, so that was fun to hear. Yeah, that's right. I, I, your name sounded familiar. I'm like, hang on, uh, didn't I work with you a long, long time ago? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's that's yeah. cool. Um, yeah. It's it's amazing how like you know technical trends and all that stuff change over time. That's right. Um, so let's actually back up a step, which is um, you know you just said that um, there's lots of problems that people can get into. So like is async writing async code like fundamentally problematic, and should people not do it? Like I uh, see you know people often talk about how quote unquote multi-threaded code is hard and dangerous is async like that well I mean uh, it can be so um, you know I think that C# -sharp has done some really amazing things with async await uh, you know the whole task parallel library that's built into .NET is fantastic it makes writing asynchronous code super easy um, but it also it's it's a little bit like giving you enough rope to hang yourself as well. So if you're not careful uh, when you're using lots and lots of tasks and everything's running in parallel, uh, it can get tricky. Um, and so where Coyote I think is sort of filling a gap is is to help you test that stuff, help you reason about it, design it, understand what it's really going to do uh, in runtime in in at production, and and then uh, be able to test it systematically and not just depend on you know random number generation, not just depend on uh, stress testing, which is like, oh, surely if we just stress test this enough, we'll find that weird interleaving between those two tasks that causes a bug, right? Well, that's not guaranteed. Um, and so, you know, stress testing, long haul testing, all that kind of stuff that people do today is, isn't really enough. And that's where Coyote's coming in saying, okay, well, uh, let's, let's see if there's a better way uh, to grapple with this stuff so that, um, so that it, uh, you can uh, go crazy with with async await and not have to worry about it so much. Uh, Make sense? That makes sense. Yeah, like yeah. one of the things we sometimes talk about on the team with a, a variety of components is this concept of cliffs. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, that's kind of one of the notions I've had about async, which is the the entry to it is amazing. Like you know, if you're just doing this thing of you you've got a client app and you're um, calling HTTP client in order to download some relatively large resource. Mm -hmm. That that whole thing is like super beneficial and relatively straightforward. And mm -hmm. I, I won't say risk free, but closer to risk free. You know, I think what you're talking about is when you get well beyond that, there there are cliffs and yep. and danger there. Yeah. I can show you I can show you some sequence diagrams from some of the uh, customers in Azure that will make your hair curl. It's it's really astonishing the amount of asynchronous stuff because in the microservice world or this uh, the cloud world, 
in order to reduce cost, you've got to maximize throughput, right? So there's this tension. You've got to, in order to maximize throughput, you've got to maximize the parallelism. And uh, so they're really pushing the envelope on on what's possible, I guess you could say, uh, with with concurrent code. And that's where you really hit that cliff that you're talking about. Okay, what, one last question before we kind of get into Coyote specifics, which is, um, you know, you talked about .NET and TPL and async await. Mm -hmm. how, how would you comp look at the more general programming landscape with respect to this problem? Is this problem, you know, unique to .NET? Is it worse or better with .NET? Can you talk to that? Um, well, yeah, I can. I can, uh, you know, I don't have experience with every programming language, mostly C++, Python, JavaScript, um, and, and all the .NET languages, but, uh, and Java. But, uh, you know, Java has some built-in primitives like uh, synchronized methods and so on. Um, and, you know, each language tends to have its own way of dealing with it. You know, Python basically says just don't do it <laughs> for the most part uh, and JavaScript, you know, which is a solution, right? I mean, uh, a lot of the um, ASP.NET is a good example of, of where they create a, a, an environment where you don't have to think about concurrency as much. They, they sort of say, hey, here's one HTTP request you can handle at a time. Yeah. Uh, that sort of thing. So, creating these higher level platforms that sort of create this, uh, you know, nice little uh, world that you can live in and ignore concurrency is, is really, you know, probably the best long-term sustainable solution. Uh, humans have a really hard time thinking about and just visualizing concurrency for some reason. Uh, we have a hard time writing concurrent code that's correct. And I've, I've seen team after team, you know, jump into it with gusto and all excited, let's go write some parallel code. And then, you know, it's a very humbling experience for that team when, you know, six months later, they're still debugging it, right? Um, so I think that, um, you know, C Sharp has done some fantastic things with async await. Um, you know, I, I always try to explain to people that async await is actually building an async state machine for you under the covers. It's actually a piece of magic uh, and, it's, and it's super powerful. People should totally use it. Um, task.run, on the other hand, is where you get yourself in trouble, right? So that's where you're, you're often creating a, your own parallel world of, of things running um, all over the place. And, yeah. uh, or task.when any or when all, you know, is how you're actually launching uh, all of these tasks in parallel. So you have to be careful. And that's where I think Coyote can help. Okay, so let's jump into Coyote. Sure. If you take a look at the Coyote website, I'll um, put a link here. Um, we have a whole section on, on documentation here that explains what Coyote is about and what it's for. But I think the, uh, the really quick way to, to give you a sort of a, a drill down uh, on what it's doing is to look at this example program. This is actually a fault tolerant cluster of five servers that are acting in a um, fault tolerant cluster. So it's it's uh, implementing a, a protocol called Raft, and uh, you can actually use, uh, search online and find some really great explanations of Raft with some nice little animations. Now, uh, what this really does, if I um, run this again, I'm going to show you what this will really do when I run it in. Um, in parallel. So this is running sequentially, but if, if I run it like this, you can see what this program is actually going to do in production. And imagine now trying to debug that. <laughs> this, is, this is the kind of thing that you have to do if you want to maximize throughput and you minimize the cost of your services in the cloud. You want to maximize the concurrency of the program. And this will get you fantastic throughputs and, and so on. But Good luck debugging it. Uh, so what Coyote can do is um, systematically test every asynchronous uh, scheduling opportunity in this program and explore uh, this, this program systematically. And it does that by doing one thing at a time. And so imagine serializing all of your threads so that only one can run at a time, like you have a single core computer or something. And... Um, and then uh, imagine doing this over and over again, exploring a different path every time. This is just one iteration of a test using Coyote. Uh, and it's checking. And, and the really cool thing about running a test this way is that if it finds a bug, it can actually uh, reproduce it 
right? Without any timing dependencies, it's not dependent on on the operating system scheduling anymore. So this uh, test actually found a bug. It found a bug where two of the uh, cluster servers elected themselves as a leader, which it breaks the protocol. Um, you can imagine if you're developing a fault tolerant cluster, you really can't have bugs like this. You know, it's super embarrassing. So you want to make sure it's thoroughly tested. And that's where, where Coyote can help. Now, that was just one test iteration. Now, imagine running millions of these uh, test iterations because, you know, the state space of all of those tasks and interleavings of those tasks is huge, right? It's an exponential explosion problem. So what Coyote has done is it's built in some in, uh, intelligence uh, scheduling algorithms that were developed by Microsoft Research to help it uh, search this state space. So you can think of this as a search problem. Massive amount of uh, possibilities that you're searching and you have to find the bug that's hiding in there somewhere. And uh, that's what Coyote is really good at. Makes, makes sense. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'd like to do is uh, show a really simple example. We have a Hello World example of how Coyote can do this. Over here, this is our Hello World example. So I'd like to show a really simple example using uh, Coyote. And this is a task-based program. So you can see that uh, we're using the task type from .NET. And um, what I'm doing on purpose here in this program is I'm going to launch one, two, three, four, five tasks in parallel using task.whenAll. This is going to launch these tasks in parallel. And it's going to call a method that's asynchronous. So this is using async await. Uh, it just does a small delay and sets a local variable to the string that comes in here. And I'm going to pass it uh, different strings, um, hello world and good morning. and when I run this in parallel, um, one of those tasks is going to run last, right? It has to, one of them has to be scheduled at the end. And whoever runs last is the one that's going to actually be the final setter of this value. And down at the bottom, I'm going to assert uh, that that value is equal to hello world. Of course, it's not always going to equal hello world. It's, uh, in this case, um, if this task, the task one, is scheduled uh, um, last, then it'll be set to good morning. So this assert should fail sometimes. And when I run this program, we'll see what it does. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I, I get it. <laughs> uh, and of course, we'll see either hello world or it'll actually blow up. So it actually did report hello world that time. Yeah, um, works, works on my box, shipped to production. <laughs> That's right, exactly, right? So this is a, a classic example of non-determinism. Obviously, it's a very trivial example, but non-determinism happens in our programs all the time when we're doing parallel programming. And um, so Coyote then can actually come along and test this thing. And what I can do is I'll uh, use the Coyote tool. I can actually uh, install it with .NET tool install. There's a new, you know, .NET tools are really cool. So we've got one called Microsoft Coyote.cli command line interface. I'll just make it global for now. And pretty soon I'll have the Coyote command line tool, which has some command line arguments. What this tool can do is it can actually test this program. But let me explain one thing first, which is in order to test this program, uh, what Coyote wants to do is systematically test every possible interleaving. What that means is, you know, task one, then three, then two, then four, then five in one iteration. The next test iteration, it might test this, you know, ordering of tasks and, and so on and so forth. You can imagine this is a, a long list of possibilities. And that's just uh, one set of possibilities. Uh, there's actually multiple scheduling points in here because of the task.delay. So it'll actually test every interleaving of, of asynchronous operations in this program. In order to do that, what we've done is we've created a drop-in replacement for the .NET task called Coyote task, Microsoft.coyote.tasks. So notice I'm not using system.threading.tasks here. Instead, I'm, I'm using this one. What that does is it gives Coyote the ability, the ability to totally control and um, stop and start and, and really get in, in charge of the async behavior of this program uh, so that it can test it systematically. So I'll run Coyote test. 
And the program that I want to test is um, Hello World Tasks, which is the program we've got right there. And I'll give it 100 iterations. Uh, maybe that will be enough time for it to discover the interleaving that results in the assert to fail, right? And this, this Coyote test tool is only useful if it can reliably reproduce that bug as opposed to totally depending on random operating system scheduling. <laughs> okay, there you go. It did not reproduce the bug. Let's give it more iterations, which you know is obviously one thing you can do. Okay, after iteration 60 this time, it found the bug. And uh, you get a little report here. It gives you the call stack, and then it gives you the assertion failure that happened here. Uh, now, what's really cool about this is not that it found the bug, but uh, the really cool thing is that you can now replay this bug. So if you had a really complex program, and I'll show you one in a second, um, then uh, you can actually use replay. So what we do is we don't uh, we produce that log file, but we also produce a um, a schedule of all of the choices that were made in that in that iteration that failed. So iteration sixty, I guess it was, that failed will have a, a schedule associated with it and now I can replay that bug exactly and I can replay this in the debugger and I can step through this program doesn't matter how many breakpoints I hit it will always guarantee to hit the bug which is super cool um, you can imagine how that would be uh, a lifesaver in situations I mean we've literally had customers that use coyote that have told us that they've been trying to find a bug for months uh, it was that tricky and uh, then they got it all up and running inside Coyote and they found it in, in minutes and were able to debug it. Um, so this can save you a lot of time. <laughs> so this is a little bit-ish like time travel debugging in that sense. Uh, right. A, um, a little bit like that, except that um, you don't have to go back in time. You um, can step through that schedule from start to finish. Um, yeah. Pre it presumably you could use time travel debugging in that debug session <laughs> of that iteration that failed, if you need to. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. get it. Yeah. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. Now, uh, what we did is, you know, let's let's show a slightly more complicated example. So uh, there was this extreme programming challenge that was put out there by a guy named Tom Cargill, and uh, in that challenge, he said things like, you know, concurrent programs are hard to test because of the complex combinatorial explosion of the state space that must be covered. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is this is like he was writing this intro paragraph. It was like he was writing an intro paragraph for Coyote. But uh, he, he in introduces a little Java program here, and it's using synchronized Java methods. And um, it's a producer-consumer queue where uh, the put method can block if the buffer is full. The take method can block if the buffer is empty. And then there's notify and wait uh, that are used to kind of uh, communicate between these two synchronized methods uh, so that if somebody does do a take and the buffer is empty, it has to wait. But if somebody then does a put, then the notify will wake up that, that guy. And he said that these kinds of programs, this program actually has a really nasty deadlock. And he was asking the people, hey, find the deadlock for me. Figure out a test, you know, an extreme testing uh, methodology that will guarantee that um, people that are moving in a really agile environment don't ship bugs like this and so we thought okay that's a that's a fantastic uh, example for for coyote so what we did is we ported that program to c sharp because it was originally written in java c sharp doesn't have synchronized methods but it has something uh, very similar actually it's more powerful which is a, a synchronizing object uh, that you can use in a lock statement everything else is available so uh, the system uh, threading monitor has a wait method so if the buffer is full we can wait and pulse is how you notify the other threads that they can continue and sure enough when you run this program it looks you know all looks fine um, here's our buffer and so on this is straight straight port and sure enough if you run this program in C sharp um, it deadlocks sometimes uh, and you know how often it deadlocks is is unknown, um, and how to reproduce that deadlock is really hard. Uh, it absolutely does not reproduce a deadlock in a debugger. Uh, if you start putting logging statements in here to understand what's happening, it stops reproing. Uh, it's one of those you know pull your hair out, stay up all night kinds of bugs. And so what we've done is we've uh, used Coyote to uh, see if we can find this bug. 
so what we what we do with Coyote then is um, we uh, have a drop-in replacement for system.monitor. So instead of using uh, the system.monitor, we actually used a Coyote type called synchronized block. And um, since uh, the C-sharp lock statement doesn't know about it, we have to use it this way. So it's a using synchronized block. Everything else looks the same. So there's a weight, there's a pulse, uh, and so forth. So it's pretty much the exact same code, except that it's a type that Coyote can control in a systematic testing kind of way. So, but now the question uh, that was posed on the on Extreme Programming Challenge is, how do you even test this thing? How do you how do you test uh, to to even know that the bug is there? Uh, it was interesting if you look at the discussion online. A lot of people were were trying to test it and concluding, hang on, there is no bug, <laughs> which was funny because there actually is. Um, so that's the part of the trick is how do you actually find the bug in the first place, uh, or how do you find a test that reproduces the bug? Uh, and so what we can do here in this code is uh, we can actually use Coyote to explore the this very large state space to find the minimal test case that actually uh, reproduces the bug. Because, you know, sure, you might be able to reproduce the bug with 50 threads, but then it's impossible to debug, right? So what's the minimal uh, repro that can demonstrate the bug in the code. So what we did with Coyote is we used Coyote random number generator uh, to generate a random buffer size, a random number of reader threads, a random number of writer threads, a random number of iterations in each one of those threads, and so on. So um, when you use the Coyote random number generator, it's something that the Coyote test tool can play with, uh, those random choices, and explore that space. Then we're able to create a bounded buffer with that given size. We're able to add all of the ta reader tasks, all of the writer tasks, where reader and writer is just down here. So reader is just something that does a certain number of reads, and writer is a certain number of puts and takes. Right. So um, that's that's the uh, that's so this is now going to explore lots of different ways of testing this thing, and uh, we can run that like this, just the same way, boundedbuffer.dll. Now, this guy has uh, some different test methods, so it's going to ask us to choose one. And I will choose the test method named find deadlock. And let's, you know, the cool thing about this exploration is I can really now just go to town and say, you know, run a million iterations and um, until you find a bug. And the other thing you can do is you can um, tell it to keep running and find all the different test configurations. What this will do, it found it found a configuration that fails. And that what it does is it prints out what that was. So it prints out that the buffer size was two. We had five threads that were reading, three threads that were writing, and so on and so forth. Now, that's great. That's nine, well, five plus three is eight tasks. Not too bad. But what's the minimal uh, test? Uh, and what we can do is we can say explore. So instead of stopping on the first bug, just keep running. And so we did this and ran it, you know, you can actually run it overnight if you want, but you can run it uh, long enough that you can get a whole bunch of different test configurations and it's finding a lot of bugs here, right? Which is great. So we did that and we found the minimal test, which is this one, which we can then code up the minimal test once you know what it is. And it's a buffer size of one. It is two read threads and one writer thread. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, and let's see if that one fails. Um, I will just do this again to get the name of that test method. Dash M minimal deadlock. And with this one, I can, um, you know, just run 100 iterations should be enough. Sure enough, like iteration one, it already hit the bug. All right, so cool. Now we have a minimal test thing, and as I said before, you've got a replayable schedule. Now the the really cool thing about that, and we have it um, listed up here, is that um, once you've got the minimal repro, you can actually go through and uh, instrument it with all kinds of logging because you've got that schedule file, right? So now I can uh, log every detail, and and that's what I did here, in um, in this program, this is a little blog here that explains what we did. Um, and I'm just looking for the graph that shows the bug. So I was I was able to inject logging inside the the take and the put methods, every section of those methods, uh, where you entered, where you waited, where you, the wait was complete, 
where it was actually doing something, the pulse, the exit of the method. And um, both methods, the, the take and the put, were instrumented the same way. And then I run that schedule, right? I run that replayable schedule to see what happened. And we can see here, this explains you know, why it was deadlocking. So you've got two reader threads that are waiting. The, take, uh, the put thread goes through and succeeds. It sends a pulse over to here. Now, what's interesting is it's, it's trying to wake up a reader, but what I didn't know was possible with system uh, threading monitor is that um, this blue thread was able to continue running and get back into and re-enter that lock, hit the wait state before the reader thread woke up. So there's a little delay in time there that happens when you do a pulse. It's not, it's, it's not predictable. It's not guaranteed. And that's why it's so sensitive to debugging and, and logging and so on that that timing condition has to be just right for it to hit that deadlock. And uh, this woke up the reader thread, which was able to receive that item. It then sent a pulse. And here's the, the real problem is that the pulse woke up the wrong task. It, it woke up this reader that was waiting and of course, the buffer is now empty because the buffer size was one. And so the, this reader thread just has to go straight back to sleep. And then the orange thread uh, goes back around the loop of iterations and re-enters the lock. And it's now waiting. So we've got all three tasks waiting and you have a deadlock. So this is an absolutely crystal clear explanation now why this thing is deadlocking. Uh, so I think you can now see the whole thread of, of you know, Coyote is, is not just a test tool. It's a tool that can help developers reason about their code. It helps you with design. It helps you with testing. It helps you uh, understand what's happening in the code. Uh, that was an awesome walkthrough. Uh, I mean, that just demonstrates the power of this tool super well. I, I have just uh, two follow-up questions before mm -hmm. we close. One is, um, uh, you obviously have to have uh, an assembly reference to Coyote, like it's kind of part of your app at this point. That's right. Um, and uh, not everyone will want to to kind of ship Coyote into production. So, uh, you know, what's your answer then? And the last question is just like, how do you get started? Sure, absolutely. No, it's a great question. And um, uh, Coyote has this sort of super lightweight uh, runtime. Uh, that is, you know, helping it to intercept these uh, types at test time. At, at uh, runtime in production, the, uh, micro, uh, the Coyote namespace is actually a very, very thin wrapper on top of system.threading.task. So it's, it's just delegating directly. Uh, until you run it inside a Coyote test, then you're, you're using the Coyote systematic test engine. So, yep, there is a dependency there on Microsoft Coyote. If um, that doesn't work for your team, then you're out of luck. We are investigating other ways uh, of doing this where it does not require a runtime dependency. Um, but uh, for now, this is this is how it is. We have um, teams in, in Azure that have been using this for quite a while in production. So we're pretty confident that this is pretty rock solid code. Uh, goes through full, you know, Azure DevOps pipelines of continuous integration testing. We have huge test code base for this thing. We're pretty confident that it's it's good uh, to take a dependency on it. Um, but um, you're correct that uh, some people may not be able to. Um, in terms of getting started, then yeah, uh, all you need to do is add uh, a reference to that NuGet package and uh, start coding. Uh, you you write the uh, you know you drop in the system coyote tasks types, and then you use that uh, command line tool that I showed you uh, to systematically test your program. So um, one thing that I didn't I glossed over a little bit before is how does coyote know what to test, and that's done with a test attribute. Uh, this is a little bit like uh, what you would see with X unit or N unit or something where you have a, a test attribute on a method, and that tells coyote this is the entry point. Uh, Kaidi has uh, some other things to help with logging and, and random number generation and so on that uh, is a little runtime object that you can use as well at test time uh, to help you make some test decisions so, or, and, and so on. Um, so that's how you get started. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks for coming by and uh, giving us an intro to Coyote. I think there's a ton of folks that would uh, really benefit from, from uh, using this. Cool. Thanks, Rich. Okay. Well, this has been another episode of On.net. Uh, today, we looked about how to write more reliable code using this new tool called Coyote.